أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد أشرف المرسلين وعلى صحبه أجمعين ومن اتبع لسنته إلى يوم الدين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته يا أيها الإخوة والأخوات السلام عليكم brothers and sisters I hope you're all well I hope you're in a good state uh, it occurred to me today at in an overwhelming manner actually to make this tape to address what is quickly becoming the dominant applied and implied ideology in modern society to address the tenets of that ideology and to address how that tenet is problematic for Muslims today. This ideology is generally termed as liberalism. Liberalism. Liberalism is an umbrella word that covers a lot of different philosophies. Traditionally, when the word liberalism was used, hence the word classical liberalism, it was a political and economic theory that was based on allowing people to do with their wealth and with their properties what they wanted to do. It wasn't necessarily centered around morality because the societies in which classical liberalism was practiced in were Christian societies and there were societies in which they still had a belief in basic morality, even if their morality was hypocritical, as judged by the fact that they, those same societies enslaved people on very flimsy principles. Liberalism has since evolved in that time to be more so in relation to a set of social and somewhat economic principles as well. For example, when we talk about the political party of the liberals, that combines both the social and the political. The political having to do more so with uh, a welfare society, with you know promoting certain uh, mechanisms that allow people to reliably get help from the state, which is not a bad thing. But in this tape, what we're addressing is social liberalism, social liberalism, which comes out of mostly the realm of philosophy. It's an, it's, it's an ideology. What are the tenets of social liberalism? When we look at social liberalism, we see that there are several foundational tenets. The first is the social liberalism is entirely secular. It is entirely secular. What we mean by the fact that it's entirely secular is that it does not acknowledge the right or the position of God and the determination of the matters of either the state or any type of human community. It does not recognize the right of God to determine anything or to even be considered in anything. Now, this secularism, it ranges from benign secularism, which is where the state will overlook religiosity and people can be religious as they deem, to extreme militant secularism, which is what you see in places like France, whereby religion, religion is actively seen as an enemy and religion is actively fought against. So that's the first principle of uh, liberalism, of social liberalism. The second principle of social liberalism is that it is what they call humanist. It's humanist because of the fact is that the natural consequence of secularism is that it has to be humanist. They center every decision on what is seemingly in the best uh, pleasure or desirable to the human being. 
You understand that every single human being has a right to pursue what is pleasurable and desirable to them. Now, that naturally produces uh, consequences that they deal with through the third tenet of social liberalism, which is the which is the consideration that social liberalism is utilitarian, in the sense that because there's no God determining the rules, and because human beings have placed themselves at the center of of uh, of determining what is ethical and what is not, then there has to be a limit. So their limit is that effectively whatever maximizes pleasure, whatever maximizes pleasure to the value of a person is what is correct without considering, uh, without stepping on the, on, the, on the pleasure of another person. And this was famously explicated on by John Stuart Mill and what he termed as the harm principle. That effectively, you can do whatever you like, so long as you don't harm others. Now, there are problems with this ideology from the perspective of a Muslim, from the perspective of the ideology itself, and from the perspective of the contradictions that exist in its application. The first thing is, as a Muslim, is that each of these things is against our creed. Secularism, first and foremost, is against what a Muslim is uh, supposed to believe. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that legislates. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that deems what is fundamentally right and wrong. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Ma'idah, those who judge by other than what Allah has revealed, those are the kafirs. Meaning that they choose a reference point be aside from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So secularism as a belief is completely, completely, completely kufr. To believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has no place in dictating uh, in dictating the laws, in dictating the mores, in dictating the values of human beings is something that goes outside of Islam. It's one thing to be practically under it, and it's another thing to believe that that is the best default state. Whoever believes that that's the best default state, then their Islam is not sound, because that's a belief of kufr. The second thing is the idea of humanism. The idea of humanism effectively places human beings at the center of all moral and ethical considerations. It places them at the center of all ethical and moral considerations. And from a Muslim's perspective, this is wrong. A human being is a mukallaf, meaning that he is a responsible moral agent. But look at the word. The word is mukallaf, meaning he's someone that's been ascribed agency. That agency is given to him. He's not the mukallif. He's not the determinant of ethics. The determinant of ethics, once again, is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that is the mukallif. He's the one that gives agency to people. Thereby they become mukallafun. They become legally and morally responsible agents of being. Whereas in the social liberalist mind state, that this is not the case, that human beings are the ones that determine what is right and what is wrong. Thirdly, the idea of utilitarianism in the sense that whatever is correct, whatever is pleasurable to a human being uh, is what is correct, is not something that is Islamic. Islam does not place pleasure at the center of the human experience. Islam does not place pleasure at the center of human experience. You understand? Because of the fact that pleasure is simply a portion of our existence. It's not the comprehensive element of our existence. So to use what is pleasurable to us, what feels good, as John Stuart Mill describes it in his harm principle, or what we find to be good as the deciding factor is very problematic because it's 
very open to a lot of subject subjectivities and even aside from the problematicness of it just from addressing how it stands with islam we see that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he says will you take the one or have you seen the one that follows his passion as his god would you be responsible for that person in that case no so that's that's the addressing the ideology briefly from the standpoint of how it correlates or uh, how it intersects with Islam. And that the, the fact is, it is an incomplete diametric opposition with Islam. The second thing is the application of the ideology itself is very problematic, especially in the sense of humanism. Because when they tell you humanism, they say on the outward, what is supposedly beneficial for all human beings there is a philosopher named Martha Nussbaum. She said that there are certain things that if human beings uh, don't agree are needed, then they're simply wrong. And one of her things was such as the right of women to wear whatever they want. The reality is that their humanism is not actually humanism. Their humanism is just a revamped version of what they call Orientalism. Orientalism is the belief that effectively the West has an innate and inherent superiority to the lands of the Orient, meaning the lands of the East. So anything that's not European and white is effectively seen as being lower. And that's the case. Because if you look at what happens today, what they are promoting is not what they are promoting 100 years ago. What the Western world was promoting 120 years ago when it conquered Africa and when it colonized, uh, excuse me, when it, when, it, when it enslaved Africans and when it colonized uh, Africa and when it colonized South, Af South America, when it colonized Asia, uh, what they were promoting then was what they call the so-called white man's burden under the guise of what they call scientific racism. They said that effectively the white man has the burden to civilize all of humanity that the white man has the burden of civilizing all of humanity. This is a burden that's been laid down upon us. And they justified this in two ways. They justified this, one, through their Hamitic myth, which was their claim that, uh, that yes, the, the, the dark-skinned children of Ham are lesser than the white-skinned uh, children of Seth, according to the Bible. That's their belief. The second belief they justified it with was to say that, no, there's such a thing as quote-unquote evolution and right now we are at the pinnacle of evolution and black people have smaller brains and brown people have smaller brains they have less developed civilizations and therefore we are the epitome of civilization and therefore we have the right to impose this upon them until they quote-unquote reach this level that was what they were saying 120 years ago today the content of what they're saying is different but the same principle exists as far as placing themselves at a position where they effectively view themselves as God. Because what they are saying is today, we have this ideology, we have certain views under humanism, and whoever does not believe it is backwards, because we have reached the pinnacle of enlightenment. So we, that we, we, we are deemed, or we are positioned to be the legislators of morality upon all of human beings. Because if it's one thing, if they call it Westernism, that these are the values that we hold true to be the case for every Western citizen, that's one thing. It's still incorrect as far as the content of it, but it'd be, it would be another thing. But from the fact that they call it humanism, and they make this to be a supposedly universal value, when not everybody agrees with it, it shows, it indicates that the desire of those who promote these ideologies is the same as the desire of their ancestors 120 years ago, which is to place... Europeans and white people in the position of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah is the legislator and they want to remove Allah and make themselves the legislator the legislation the legislators and this is contingent upon and reflective of their desires because whatever their desire is at that particular time is what they will enact into law and you will see that they will impose it with a type of force that shows that they will not tolerate any opposition to it. If 120 years ago, someone decided to go against colonialism, they would destroy you. We see in the Muslim lands, for example, you are not allowed to have Sahih al-Bukhari. 
We see in the Muslim lands, for example, what happens to the likes of Umar Mukhtar in Libya, what happens to the likes of Sheikh Ahmed Bamba in Senegal, was that they were either executed after being hunted down, or they were exiled and subject to very difficult trials at the hands of these Europeans. That same thing exists today. Whoever speaks out against these ideologies in a public manner, they're deemed as being backwards, they're deemed as being this, they're deemed as being that, and they are forced to either apologize or every type of benefit that they have is stripped from them. So this is not really humanism. This is an imposed Orientalism that is wrapped in secular value. That's another problem with it. Another significant problem with it is that it has no internal consistency. It has no internal consistency, and it has no external consistency as well. By internal consistency, we mean that its products are consistent with itself, that what is produced by this particular ideology is consistent with itself. By external consistency, we mean that the way that it's applied here is the way that it's applied elsewhere. Let's address the internal consistency first. One of the things that they promote to us today is the idea that love is love. You see the German team, for example, they wore these one love armbands and then they were able to go and they said, uh, and, they, and, they, and they went and they put their, their hands on their mouths in Qatar and they said that, oh, we're protesting this particular law that Qatar has. This was what they said. But yet, if you stop and you look at the application of these principles and these ideologies, you see that they themselves will refuse the things that their principles should allow, but their desires won't allow them to accept. What's an example of this? There is an allowance for, in Canada and in the United States, and in just about every Western country, if a man wants to have a girlfriend and a wife, it's legal. If a man wants to have two girlfriends, it's legal. If two men want to sleep with each other, it's legal. If a man and three men want to sleep with each other, it's legal. But yet, in these very same countries, polygamy is disallowed. You're not allowed to. Uh, you're not allowed to 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 marry more than one woman. For example. Where, what is the difference fundamentally? And them and those different and those things. If you claim that love is love, if love is love, then there is no difference between those things. Likewise, if you claim that love is love, there is no reason why two a brother and a sister should not be able to get married and have intercourse. But that's illegal. That's illegal. There's no reason why a man and a dog would not be able to get married. But that's illegal. And they themselves, they make the claims that, oh, and they themselves are disgusted by that. But they make the claim that, oh, you know, uh, 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 ma uh, marriage between a man and a woman has, excuse me, marriage between a brother and a sister will produce congenital defects. Or they'll say that, you know, a, uh, a dog can't consent, you know, things of that nature that effectively there's harm in those things. But there is, a, there is clear harm in the behavior that exists between a man and a man having, having intercourse. If you look at scientific studies, one of the major terms that you'll see in literature is the term MSM, men who have sex with men. That's just a homosexual. Men who have sex with men. That is used in a lot of studies to illustrate the negative, uh, the negative uh, uh, health effects that come with it. Just Google negative health effects, men who have sex with men, Google Scholar, and you'll see a plethora of articles. So the idea that it produces harm is, 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 is the, the idea that one is harmful and the other is not, that's why we ban one, is not true. Because they allow this one, and this one has the same level of harm. Because a brother and a sister could use contraception. Therefore, they'd be following their pleasure and they're not harming anyone. Yet that's illegal. And you will not see a single, a single advocate of, uh, of LGBT rights, for example, advocating for incest rights. You're not going to see a single one. You're not going to see a single one advocating for bestiality. You're not going to see a single one advocating for polygamy. You're not going to see a single one advocating for incest. Because one is contingent upon their desires and the other is contingent upon uh, the other one is, 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 is not according to their desires, so they'll reject one 
and they will accept the other one. So it's not internally consistent. The second thing is that it's not externally consistent. I mean that the way it's applied to different groups is problematic. What's the evidence for this? You can look in the West and you'll see that according to this ideology, if a person is if a person comes and you get on TV and you berate or you say, I disagree with these people, they'll destroy you. Right? With if you dis- if you disagree with the core principles that they're promoting. But you can be a young black man talking about the destruction of other young black men in a song and they will make you rich. That's not externally consistent. These same people, while promoting this ideology in the West, will take other actions that are completely, completely, completely immoral. They'll destroy the the economies of other, other countries. They'll be complicit in the bombing of other countries. They'll watch as the politicians do the most horrendous things and approve the most horrendous things to affect the lives of human beings across the globe. But they'll remain silent upon that because there is no external consistency to their ideology. The ideology fundamentally is nothing more than a reproduction of their desires. It's not based on a sound and reproductible uh, 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 philosophy that is of benefit to all human beings. Such a philosophy only exists in Islam. So everything that you see, all of these plethora of isms, feminism, uh, 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 whatever the ism might be, whatever the theory might be, it's all based in this fundamental paradigm. And the paradigm ultimately, it doesn't do anything to, to, to benefit human beings. It doesn't do anything to benefit human beings. If you look at these communities that that they're producing, these communities have some of the highest suicide rates because they, they because they're they're they they've destroyed themselves. They destroyed their akal. You look at certain celebrities that are castrating their children at the age of nine years old because they believe that their children are girls, but that same child is not able to make the decision to go buy a cigarette. You understand? So this is the, the, the reality of this ideology. And we must know as Muslims, ultimately, that what is behind this ideology is shaitan. You understand? Know, behind every crooked deviation, the Messenger of Allah, Allah, he drew a line. He drew a line, a straight line. He said, this is the Surah al Mustaqim. And he drew different lines going to different ways from that original source point. And he said that this is the straight path, and these are other paths upon which there are shayateen, devils that are sitting there, calling people to it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in, the sh- in this Quran, that the, in Surah Al-An'am, that the devils, the, the polytheists, those who commit shirk, and they associate partners of Allah, the devils make it pleasing to them to kill their own children. You see people today, they are standing outside in the freezing cold, championing, the, the 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 fact of someone, you know, uh, of of killing their own child. Don't let it fool you and say that oh it's because certain house situations. No, that's the that's the minority. The majority of those people that do that, it's just they don't want to deal with the products of their desire. That's what it has come down to, and that's and that's what's occurring. You're castrating your own children physically and chemically, and ideologically. That's the devil that's calling them to that. There are satanic forces in the world. That's what Muslims need to realize. There are satanic forces in the world that exist to this very day. And their affair and their orientation is nothing more than to lead to the destruction of the human being in this life to cause them grief and to cause them the ultimate grief in the hereafter. So Muslims have to really be aware of what is occurring. They need to use their intellect and not be swayed not be swayed so easily just because the news says something, just because your university professor says something. These are people of desire, I promise you. We have read thousands of articles. We've seen thousands of thinkers. And their approaches, more often than not, is based on their desires. And anyone that studies the flow of their thoughts and their discourse across the decades will see that it's not consistent and then it's just based on their desire and it's based on their refusal to accept Islam. And it's based on their refusal to accept Islam. 
So inshallah, we hope this tape was beneficial. Uh, I wish I could have said more, but I think this is sufficient. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us understanding and tawfiq. Wa ma'a dhalika Allah bi aziz. Inna dhalika Allah yasir subhanahu wa ta'ala bi aziz. Ya Allah yasifun. Wa salamu ala al-mursaleem. Wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin. Allahumma salli wa salamu ala sayyidina wa alayhi wa sallam. Amin ya